Hello, and welcome to What It Takes. I'm Tom Landon. The novelist and screenwriter Sidney Sheldon once said that libraries store the energy that fuels the imagination. They open up windows to the world and inspire us to explore and achieve and contribute to improving our quality of life. Indeed, civilizations have been judged by the quality of their libraries since ancient times. And my guests today are Catherine Fitzgerald Wyatt, Education and Outreach Manager for the Library of Virginia in Richmond, and Barbara Batson, who serves as the organization's exhibition coordinator. And I'm delighted that they made the drive all the way from Richmond today to share what's going on at the library. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. We've had a lot of conversations on the phone, so I'm really glad to, to get the chance to sit down with you, I guess the first question, and, I, and I'll, I'll aim this at you, Catherine, first, is just for people who don't know, what's the Library of Virginia and how's it different from other libraries? That's a great question, Tom. So what I always tell people um, when they first ask that question is, the Library of Virginia is like your public library or like your school library if you're a student, but also very different. So we are actually the state library as well as the state archives. Um, we have books, but perhaps not all of the fiction bestsellers you might find, maybe just ones by Virginia authors. And we also have records, um, local and other government records, of just the lives of everyday, ordinary citizens of the Commonwealth. Our collection dates back over 400 years. And so our hope is that you can come to the library, do research maybe on a person from your family, or a current law that you're wanting to know more about and kind of get the answers that you're looking for. And um, as the exhibition coordinator, I know Barbara, you're probably really, you get to have the fun of going through what's in the library when you're creating, um, when you're creating an exhibition. Um, but talk about the importance of, you know, the library as a place where things are exhibited. Well, the thing about, about, I tell people I have the best job in the library. Mm -hmm. I work with a great collection. I work with really smart people who love what they do. And I learn something new every day, which I just can't imagine anything better than that. But doing the exhibitions, the way of getting our collections out into the public in front of them, looking at the original documents. So that you're not looking at something that's digital, um, that's been blown up, um, you know, you could and sometimes in photographs we do that when we do photographic exhibitions. The photograph itself could be a little itty bitty thing, but we can blow that up and you see all kinds of things in the photograph that you, details that you don't normally see. But reading the documents, looking at the original documents, you see this little slip of paper that maybe has, if you read it, somebody's entire life right there on that piece of paper. That's kind of thrilling and I think, you know, looking at things digitally or looking at it on a computer screen, you don't get a sense of the texture and the fact that somebody really handled this piece of paper. Could have been somebody famous, more often than not, as Catherine said, it's ordinary Virginians who petitioned the General Assembly or, or wrote a letter to their great grandmother uh, or included a photograph or something like that. So it's, there, it's all about the stories that we have, not hidden away, but sort of un, you need to uncover the stories at the library. And given the long history of Virginia, 1607, you know, um, how far back do the, does the collection go of things that you have at the library? It goes all the way back to the colonial period and even further. We have um, over, let's see, over 129 million items in our collections. So I always tell people when they physically come to the library, you know, we, the building occupies an entire city block in downtown Richmond. And um, we have what's called a closed stack system, meaning most of the books you can't see. But we have two floors which just house materials that if you were to take the shelving would stretch 55 miles. And that doesn't even contain all of the collection. We have an off-site facility near the Richmond Airport where we have less kind of frequently requested materials. But if you go to the mezzanine level of the library in the special collections area, there is a rare books section, um, which is not publicly accessible, but the rare books folks will bring out books that date back sometimes to the 16th century. And so I have seen um, really early materials that obviously were purchased at some point or donated to the library, but that not only tell the history of the Commonwealth, but also the nation and the early world. 
You know, I've had the privilege of visiting the library several times and I'm always impressed. First of all, it's a beautiful building, but also um, just how helpful people are when it, when it comes time to, to doing research. And you're the education person mm -hmm. at the library. The state is large. I mean, I'm, there are parts of the state that are seven hours or more from Richmond. So um, how do you all work to make sure that you are accessible and available and, and helpful to people who maybe can't make the trip to visit? That's a great question. And so I think that as technology has sort of, you know, improved, we've been able to reach people who might never come to Richmond um, via the internet and the services that we provide online. And so we have digitized millions of documents. Um, of course, that's still a fraction of what we have, but we do take our most frequently sort of requested collections and we've tried to make them accessible. Um, I focus a lot on how we can reach teachers and students across the Commonwealth. And so we have created an entire education website where we have taken items from our collections that tie really closely to um, things that children are learning in the classroom that a teacher might want to use in a lesson on some part of Virginia's history. And we've made them um, available for free um, to be accessed wherever they are. And when it comes to exhibits, um, I, I know that you all work really hard to, you know, create the, you know, museum quality, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful exhibits that you have there. Um, tell me about some of those and, and, and how your how there's part of it that is for the person who can actually stand there and mm -hmm. view these items and also, you know, the, the rest. Well, we're like a lot of places, like museums. We do our physical exhibitions at the library. Um, it's a small gallery, sort of in the back part of the main lobby. Um, but then we also create very often what we call banner exhibitions. They're pull-up banners that can travel to public libraries, uh, schools, um, smaller museums and historical societies that are around the state. I think I've got five different ones on the road right now. Um, sometimes they have interactive ac parts, electronic parts with them or not. But that's another way of getting the material, at least the scholarship and some of the images out to the public. And then we also try to do some sort of an online version of it. For the recent exhibition on woman's suffrage, um, our colleague Mary Julian took it upon herself, God bless her, to take a lot of the research that we had, that we had uh, conducted for the exhibition and put that onto the education website. Uh, and it's just chock block full of, of biographies of suffragists that we just learned about, we didn't know about until we started doing the research. Um, just some of the documents, we had the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia records digitized and transcribed. So all of that is available online or will be soon. Um, so we try to leverage the exhibitions and, and the research that goes on to those in as many ways as we possibly can. So for example, the current, the next exhibition, which opens on February 7th, is called Your Humble Petitioner. Probably most people would never consider petitioning the General Assembly for a divorce. But that's what Virginians, Virginians had to do from about 1776 until about 1865. If you wanted to run a ferry, you had to petition the General Assembly and get a law passed in order to a, get a divorce or run the ferry. So we have this collection of about 25,000 petitions. I've only chosen 14 of them for display. It's a small number, um, but it's, it's a collection that's accessible. We've digitized the microfilm. You can actually search these things, and they're fascinating stories. And again, these are papers written by ordinary Virginians mm -hmm to their legislators to try to get a law passed. Right, so something could, could end up very easily, you know, in the Library of Virginia that, that uh, if, you, if, you write to, uh, if, if you write a petition, it may end up there. I want to put a plug in real quickly because we are partnering with the Library of Virginia uh, through our Echo channel here at Blue Ridge PBS to share the, some of the resources from the mm -hmm. suffrage um, exhibit, and those are available if you'd like to know more about that exhibit, which is no longer up. Yeah. But you can you can go back and, and learn more about that. Uh, we have I think eleven uh, separate videos mm -hmm. that that we're 
that we're sharing with the public and, mm -hmm. and available on demand. I know they're on demand in, on your website as well, yeah. but uh, we, we're really excited about that partnership and I hope that with the new exhibit, which you say goes up February, this show will, by the time it airs, it will be past February, but when is that exhibit, uh, the it closes, petition show? It closes on November 19th, okay. so it's the weekend before Thanksgiving. So you've got plenty of time from yeah. now, the time you're watching this show, <laughs> until November if you want to go to Richmond to see that. Yeah. Um, when we talk about exhibits and teacher work and everything else, COVID obviously had a major impact on all of us, but when you are a place that people like to come to visit to see things, that must have been hard. Tell me about how that impacted you all in the education department there. Sure, sure. Well, one of the things that happened was um, Barbara and I actually hosted our last public program before the library closed to the public for several months in March of 20, 2020. 2020. And it was a small um, discussion format program called Civic Conversations. And, you know, when we found out we were going to be closing, we, I think like everyone, thought it was somewhat temporary or short term. When we realized it wasn't, um, we sort of thought to ourselves, okay, most of the programming we do is in person. We had been talking about for a while, branching out, doing virtual programming, but you know, quite frankly, our equipment, you know, we weren't set up really to do that very easily, but we were forced to. And I, I think it was a really good thing for us. Um, Barbara and I and another colleague took our iPhones, um, bought a tripa uh, tripod and a Yeti mic and filmed some of those early suffrage videos that you'll see using just that equipment, writing scripts ourselves. Another colleague was kind enough to do some editing and sort of back-end work for us. And we also took all of our programming that was scheduled for the spring and switched it into a virtual format. So we started with our genealogy workshops, which I think were the easiest to convert into a webinar series. Um, I think you all are going to have those some are of those. All, yes, those yep. are also available on Blue Ridge PBS yep. Echo. So we took, what what we did was we took the first like beginner um, workshop and broke it up into three parts. And because no one wants to watch a, a webinar, I think, for three hours, which is what our in-person workshops used to be. So we have three short videos. Um, you know, people were a little bit scared, I think, at first, but it went really well. And then we quickly switched over the majority of our planned programming for the year to be virtual. We went from genealogy to book talks to teacher professional development. Our in-person summer institute we hold every summer. We actually held a two-day virtual Zoom webinar. Um, I think the teachers really enjoyed it. I mean, the feedback we got was, we missed you, you know, being in person, but we're really glad that you did something because a lot of other places just quite frankly canceled program or suspended it. And so um, I think it ended up being really beneficial for us. We're now comfortable doing virtual programming. We've invested in some equipment. We're continuing to vet, invest in that. Right. Our challenge now is how to bring back when the situation allows a level of in-person programming and still keep that virtual element because our reach has expanded tremendously with the virtual programming. Um, we have people participating who are never going to be able to get to Richmond but are now able to, you know, learn about their family history in a genealogy workshop online. And genealogy seems to be something, I mean, that keeps coming up in my conversations and looking at your website. Um, what are what are some of the, ed, the, the resources that are at the Library of Virginia if someone's researching their family history or someone else's that might be hard to find elsewhere? Do you oh gosh, um, there's some records that are unique to Virginia, um, you know, land records, property records. Um, we have a, we work with the uh, circuit courts throughout Virginia for to digitize and conserve local records. And the local records, um, Gosh, the chancery records are amazing because this is a court of equity. So you're not, you're not, it's a, not a criminal kind of thing. You're trying to settle property issues. And they can go on for years. If you remember the Dickens novel Bleak House and chancery, that's what this is. Hmm. 
So they go on for years and they have all kinds of documentation that goes on. So there can be records about enslaved people. There can be records about churches suing each other. There can be records about women, um, and whatever. But I mean, those are local records and those you could only find at the Library of Virginia or at your, your county record, your county um, courthouse. But the thing about it is when we, they, when we work with the clerks, we digitize these records. So they are available online. And that's been a great boon, I think, to, archae uh, to archaeologists, sorry, <laughs> to genealogy. Well, it is archaeology, yeah. uh, but to genealogy, being able, geneal trying to be able to, to find their families. And then we have another project called Virginia Untold, which is the African-American narrative in Virginia. Again, it's u using a lot of the local records, the chancery and wills and documents and cor coroner's inquests and things like that, um, particularly documenting African-Americans in Virginia and getting, helping African-Americans who are researching their history to get past that 1870 census, that firewall, um, and trying to get back into the, the antebellum period and trying to track their families. Again, that's something you can do somewhat online, but not everything is online. So the things that you just have to come to, to have the library. a person that you can reach out to yeah. and, and ask for help. As just bringing up the, the um, African American history and and some of those untold histories, has the kind of scope of what the education efforts have been at mm -hmm. the music, at the library. How has that changed since your time there, or or how do you see it changing in terms of um, history being more open to telling the stories of all of us? Well, I, I definitely think it's changed since I've been at the library. So I started in 2014, and the exhibition that was going to be going up was... Um, to be sold. To be sold, and it looked at the um, Richmond slave trade, basically, um, concentrating it from the 1830s to the 1850s. And so a lot of people, when they learn about the history of enslavement, they know about the transatlantic slave trade, right? And then the narrative goes, well, that ended in 1806. And that's totally true. And the number of enslaved Africans who came to the United States via the transatlantic slave trade is relatively small compared to other places in the world. But the internal slave trade, which is what we did a study on, looks at the upwards of perhaps a million mm -hmm. um, enslaved Americans who were sold, a lot of from Richmond and Alexandria, Virginia, down to the Deep South as that part of the country was developed between the 1830s and 50s. And so for a lot of people, not just people who live currently in Virginia, when they are tracing their family back, whether they are white or a person of color, um, they end up in Virginia because it is the first colony and it is where for so many people of color, they might have had a family member who originally was sold from this area. So I remember at the time being really surprised that the Library of Virginia was um, doing an exhibit like that and I kind of stepped into it but we followed that up um, with an exhibition and again all of our exhibitions tie to our programming for the year, tie a lot of times to the professional development um, workshops, the focus for teachers. We looked at um, Virginia during the Reconstruction period which is according to some of our colleagues one of the, the least studied periods in, in American history, but particularly in Virginia. And you know, the story that's told is usually pretty depressing. You know, there's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and then there's Jim Crow. And people kind of don't talk too much about that period in between the Civil War and 1900, when in Virginia, at least, there were what, almost 100 African-American men like that, yeah. elected to the General Assembly and served? Um, you know, black men could vote for the first time and cast ballots right after the Civil War. And for individuals, there was a period um, in which they were able to progress. And we kind of skip over that in the narrative. And so we did an exhibit mm -hmm. on that, which I think, again, had a really big educational component because we brought in school groups and published um, an online exhibition that listed a lot of resources on that. And I know, I've, I, as a teacher, as a social studies teacher, uh, 
formerly. Things like the Document Bank of Virginia can be mm -hmm. really helpful for educators, even if it's not a part of a program that you all are specifically targeting. Um, do you find that that's being used by educators, that they're, you know, that they're dipping into your resources when they've got a question that they want to help? Sure, good question. Well, we created Document Bank of Virginia at the request of teachers um, who we worked with over the years as research fellows, during teacher workshops, at conferences. The common uh, sort of response we would get to teachers when we told them we were from the Library of Virginia was, wow, you guys have so much stuff, but I have a really hard time finding things on your website. Or, I actually found a document I want to use, but it's handwritten, it's not transcribed, I can maybe transcribe it, but then I don't really know who they're talking about. And the other thing was, I found this really great map in your collection or this really awesome photograph, but it's a huge file, and I'm not sure I'm even going to be able to pull it up in my classroom because our internet's not that great. So we took all of those comments and created Document Bank of Virginia, which we launched, I think, in 2015. Um, and really, it took all of those comments and tried to answer them. So we took documents from our collections, that had really big standards of learning correlation that told teachers not only about maybe their local history, their Virginia history, but also national history. And we transcribed the documents if they were handwritten. We um, gave them a couple paragraphs of context. So like, who is the person? Who's John Smith in this document? Um, you know, and what's his story? We listed the standards of learning. And then we gave um, sort of suggested activities, which were really questions to sort of prompt classroom discussion or small group work. And we've modified and kind of added to Document Bank over the years. Um, our latest sort of initiative is being led by a Virginia teacher is taking the documents and creating STEM and STEAM activities. So for a lot of teachers, particularly at the elementary level, they need to teach social studies at the same time they're doing English or maybe science or math. And so we're really trying to make the documents that we have in there as accessible to as many people as possible. We were talking earlier about your job and you, I could tell the joy you get from it. And I just wanted you to maybe share with us if, you, if one comes to mind, sort of one of those aha moments as you're going through this collection that maybe nobody's looked at a document in a long time or a, or a resource or a banner or, or you know, anything that, oh my gosh. you know, maybe, maybe I can narrow it down a little bit to <laughs> like the suffrage exhibit. Were there things that you found that you just went, oh, I can't believe we have this. this well, is great. yes, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> right before <laughs> or as part of the exhibition, uh, we received a donation of the minute book of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, which was established in 18, in, excuse me, in 1913, 1914. And the Virginia chapter was established in June of 1915. We knew a little bit about him, not a whole lot. They're, reading the minute book was fascinating. Mm -hmm. This is the group founded by Alice Paul that becomes a little more confrontational. They're not gonna try to persuade on the state level these men that women have the right to vote. They're gonna go on the national level. And so these are women in Virginia who were members of their local equal suffrage league chapters and said, this state-by-state state business is taking way too long, so we're going to go to the federal. And they, become, they pick it, they march in Washington, D.C. They embarrass the bejesus out of the president um, by throwing his words back into his face. And reading those minutes, we found so many more women. We know so much more about the Congressional Union, which later became the National Women's Party. And so it's that kind of donation of um, materials to the collection. This was the history that had been hidden um, and we, we were able to sort of bring it to the fore um, and say that, yeah, Virginia women were activists and not just in a polite way. They were forceful and they could be forceful. <laughs> so right. this that is make, a good That thing. makes for a good day for you, right? <laughs> yeah, very much. We're down to about a minute left. I'll just ask you, Catherine, are there thing, you know, the short list of things you wish people knew about the library? Well, you know, we are the Library of the Commonwealth, and so we often, when I will talk about Document Bank of Virginia or another resource that we have, the first question I hear from people is, how much does it cost? 
And you know, my answer is it is free. You know, we are we are really here to serve all citizens of the Commonwealth, and um, you know that is that's part of our mission. Mm -hmm. That is our mission is is to educate and preserve. And so we just wish more people would reach out and, and take us up on our offer to help. <laughs> sure, and I, I'd highly recommend if you find yourself in Richmond that you, that you make a stop at the Library of Virginia. So once again, I'd like to thank my guests for making the drive from Richmond to share with us today. I'm surprised we're out of time already, but if you'd like to keep up with the library's activities, and especially those for educators, you can visit their website at lva.virginia.gov. For what it takes, I'm Tom Landon.